No Credits Rolled. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 4 of No Credits Rolled, where we play the games and sometimes we even finish them. My name is Sam Whalen, and for the news portion of today's show, we're going to change things up just a little bit. I want to look ahead at 2024 and discuss what each of the major console manufacturers are planning. So we're covering Nintendo, Xbox, and PlayStation in today's episode. And of course, after that, I'll give my thoughts on what I've been playing lately. So let's get into it. We're going to start with Nintendo here, because it's the company I know the least about, quite frankly. But the biggest thing for Nintendo is the Switch 2. We're all kind of waiting for the official announcement of that. It has been much rumored, much anticipated for, what, two years now? A year and a half? There was a rumor when before the Switch OLED came out that it was going to be the Switch 2 with, you know, 4K graphics and things like that. That didn't happen. But the Switch OLED is very pretty if you own one. If you play handheld especially, because otherwise you're not really getting that on the TV screen. You only see that with that fancy OLED screen in your hands. But personally, I'm really hoping they call it the Super Switch, kind of like the Super Nintendo back in the day. I think that would be a very cool name. Uh, I don't know if they're going to do that. But, I mean, they did Wii, Wii U, so it's like, do they really... You know, The naming conventions are kind of loosey-goosey. So I've got an article here from Robert Hart at Forbes. Uh, the headline reads, Nintendo Boost Switch Sales Forecast, but stays quiet on console successor. So this is a quote from Robert Hart. Uh, quote, Nintendo raised its outlook for Switch sales recently and insisted the aging console would remain its central focus heading into 2024, but keeping quiet on plans for its hotly anticipated successor after the hardware held its own against newer competitors with new additions to the Japanese giant's popular Mario and Zelda franchise. Of course, we're talking about Tears of the Kingdom and Mario Wonder, I imagine. Also, Mario Odyssey, if you go all the way back to the beginning of the Switch, but I don't know. Uh, but I wanted to highlight some sales numbers for Tears of the Kingdom to show just how much of a juggernaut this game was. So Tears of the Kingdom sold about 20 million copies in three months, which is just ridiculous. It was also nominated for a ton of awards. Just, of course, it was up for Game of the Year. Uh, it did not win, but it was nominated. Uh, and of course, Tears of the Kingdom critically acclaimed. I enjoyed it a lot more than Breath of the Wild. I don't remember if I've talked about it on this show yet. I think I talked about it on the Insights Into Things episode where we covered the Game of the Year discussion, which was sort of a, the infant stages of this podcast now. So you can go check that episode out to get more of my thoughts on Tears of the Kingdom. Another game that I have yet to finish, uh, I'm at the final boss fight. So, you know, it's fair game for the show if I want to talk about it. The Switch is the third best-selling console of all time. This is from Jess Weatherbid at The Verge. Quote, Nintendo's third quarter earnings report shows that the Switch, Switch OLED, and Switch Lite, I forgot about the Switch Lite, uh, achieved 8.2 million combined unit sales between October 1st and December 31st in 2022. So these numbers are a little outdated. Bring the lifetime total sale unit, total, total lifetime unit sales for the console to 122.55 million since it was released in 2017. Isn't it crazy to think about that the Switch came out in 2017? I mean, we're in 2024 now. We're almost a decade with the Switch. And boy, does that make me feel old. Now, what I want to talk about here is, does Nintendo necessarily need to rush out a Switch 2? I mean, Tears of the Kingdom would be a great final tentpole game to send the console out on, and that's kind of what a lot of people were um, anticipating when that game came out, because it still runs great on the original Switch, despite it being an almost 10-year-old piece of hardware. And that just goes to show the talent of these developers working with what they got. You know, it's not the graphical powerhouse that something like a, um, I don't know, Horizon Forbidden West or something is. But it's the art direction that carries those games because you don't need to be photorealistic if your art direction is strong enough because that can carry a game, you know, alone. Now, what a Switch 2, assuming it comes out within the next, you know, next in our lifetime, would it be able to compete with a PS6 or the next Xbox? I'm not even going to try to speculate on what they're going to call the next Xbox because they seem to change that naming convention uh, every release. I'm not sure a Switch 2 would be able to compete, but Nintendo is often its own animal and their fans are diehards, but it's Nintendo is usually in its own conversation. If one of their big franchises like Mario or Zelda or a Pokemon game came out, hopefully a Pokemon game that runs just at all would be nice. Uh, it's going to make them money no matter what. So Nintendo really doesn't need to stick to the traditional, you know, competition release cycles with these other companies. And that's kind of what I want to get across. 
Um, I'm not saying Nintendo is less than these other, you know, the Sonys and the Microsofts in this in this race. But I think Nintendo has always been, and that's one of the reasons why they've cultivated this big fan base, is because they are their own animal. And they kind of do whatever they want. And it's been working for a very long time. And there's no reason they're going to change that. Now, there's a lot of speculation that we're going to get that Switch 2 announcement sometime this year. Officially a Switch 2 announcement. Because up until now, it's been just a ridiculous amount of speculation. So is Nintendo going to just ride out this year with their releases and then we're going to get something prepping us for 2025 with the Switch 2? Super Switch? I'm going to hold out hope for that. Maybe. I looked up a list of some of the upcoming games Nintendo has for this year. Uh, There's Princess Peach Showtime, which looks like a ton of fun. It looks like another platformer that's probably going to be fantastic from Nintendo. Uh, Metroid Prime 4, and I put a question mark next to that in the show notes because is that game ever going to come out? Is that a real game? We don't know. They've been talking about it forever. That might be one of the things that they hold for a Switch 2. I don't know if they'd make it a launch title because I'm not sure Metroid has the mass market appeal that something like a Mario or a Zelda has. But where is Metroid Prime 4? I'm not even that big of a Nintendo fan, and I'm wondering. I can't imagine if you're a diehard Metroid fan that's been you know tracking every morsel of news we get about this game. You're probably pulling your hair out. You might be bald by now from all the hair you've pulled. Uh, what else we got? Luigi's Mansion 2 HD, which I people like Luigi's Mansion. I've personally never played it, but hey, going to get another one of those. Uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong recently released at the time of this recording, I believe. So that's out in the wild, and that is a remake of a uh, Game Boy Advance game, I think. Uh, Nintendo fans, you can correct me in the comments. Because I, you know, guys, I'm going to be honest. I'm not really the Nintendo guy. I play the big releases, but I'm not deep in there. You know, I I didn't grow up with the the SNES and stuff like that. I played a lot of Wii. I played the Switch a lot. But I'm not necessarily on the beat with Nintendo uh, like a lot of very diehard Nintendo fans are. Uh, One final game, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, which that game looks so cool. And I probably will get that one day one. I never played the original Paper Mario. So it's fun we're getting a updated version of that as well um and all these games that i've just listed are probably going to perform well uh, i'm not sure what if there's sales numbers out for mario versus donkey kong yet since it is very very recently out of the time of recording but all these games are those nintendo ips that no matter what you might think the audience for them are there is an audience out there and they're going to buy these games now of course looking at the S- switch 2 whenever that does come out Nintendo loves their ports, their HD ports, their remasters, things like that. So you got to wonder, is the Switch 2 going to be carried by remasters of Switch games? Personally, I would love a remake or an updated version of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet because basically the main reason I'm not playing that game is because it runs so poorly and looks horrific. Uh, I'm barely even in it because it is just a nightmare to look at. (laughs) Uh, I don't know. People love that game. And apparently it's supposed to be a pretty good Pokemon game, but I'm a, I can't get past the, the bugs and the, the presentation, the visual presentation of that game and the tactical performance of that game. Um, I don't know. Sue me, but with a switch Two, assuming a switch, you can do, you know, things like 4k and, and the, that increased processing power we're hoping for, you know, maybe there's a version of Pokemon violet that comes out that is, uh, you know, up to the standards we hope for. And that's another example of Switch fans being, and Nintendo fans being diehards no matter what. Because Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, I don't know if you listening have played it, but it, it's, I, I cannot overstate how ugly it is. <laughs> but it still made a ton of money when it came out. And I'm part of the problem, right? Because Game Freak is going to continue to release these busted games, and people are going to continue to buy them. And I bought it, so, I mean, can I really complain? Um... Yes. Yes, I can. But anyway, do we think the Switch 2 is going to have a big launch game? Maybe a 3D Mario? It's been a while. Uh, Not counting um, Bowser's Fury. I'm talking more like a Mario Odyssey kind of thing, uh, where it's like that more um, AAA level of Mario. You know, the the next big Mario game. Not necessarily uh, the 3D, 2D platformer stuff that we've been doing. I would love that because I, I really want to go back and play Odyssey. I really enjoyed that game. I was a big fan of Galaxy when those came out on the Wii, Galaxy 1 and 2. So I'm a sucker for those games as well. And I think 
it's very Nintendo to launch your next console with a big Mario game or a big Zelda game to kind of back it up. Now, I think, I don't think Breath of the Wild came out with the Switch, but I think it was within like a month or two of the Switch releasing. So, you know, launch window. But I think something like that would really help it get catapulted even more, especially if it's something that, you know, you show the new Mario game and it's on the Switch too and it looks incredible. So, yeah, really, I mean, when we're wrapping up the conversation about the Nintendo Switch here, it's the Switch 2 that we're waiting for. And, you know, are we going to get that news? When is that news coming? And what kind of technical specs are we getting for this next console? I'm excited to find out. I'm excited what the price point's going to be for it when it is announced. But really, uh, Nintendo is running out of tricks to pull out of its sleeve to justify continuing to run on almost 10-year-old hardware at this point. But they're still making a ton of money, so it's like they can really, you know, Nintendo's going to take its sweet time, and they really don't need to worry about, you know, fan drop-off or anything like that, because there is not going to be any fan drop-off. So moving on to the next competitor in this race, the Xbox. And Microsoft. So when you're looking at the Xbox versus PlayStation battle, Xbox is definitely losing. They're they're getting pretty dominated by PlayStation. The Xbox lags in sales and in public opinion, honestly, because when you're when you're appealing to if you're trying to get new gamers in, they're probably gonna go with the PlayStation just because of those curated first party games. There's really not a whole lot of reason to get an Xbox unless you're already grandfathered in like I was when I was younger. My dad played on the Xbox. So I was an Xbox guy for a while. But Xbox, other than having Games Pass, really doesn't have a whole lot going for it right now. And even still, uh, Sony and PlayStation has is made their own version of Games Pass with their different tiers of PlayStation Plus. However, you, you, know, you can feel one way or the other about that. But it's clearly an attempt to be Games Pass. And it's effectively the same thing <laughs> with without those um, the first-party exclusives that Xbox promises with Games Pass. But as we'll get to in this section of the show, the first-party promises from Xbox are not necessarily living up to the expectations we were hoping. Now, I don't want to, like, fuel console wars here. I know that can be very uh, toxic. But I do believe that competition can breed innovation. And the current competition is that Sony is running away with it. Uh, If Sony completely dominates the market and can scoop up every new gamer, how's Xbox going to remain relevant going forward? And Xbox is trying to answer that. They had a... Like I said, at the time of recording, they had a uh, version of their official podcast that kind of detailed their plan going forward. Uh, And that included, this is an article from Tom Warren at The Verge. Uh, He says, quote, sources familiar with Microsoft's plans tell The Verge that the company is getting ready to launch a select number of games on PS5 and Nintendo Switch. Weeks of rumors suggest that Hi-Fi Rush, Sea of Thieves, and even Bethesda titles like Starfield are joining Indiana Jones or sorry, Bethesda titles like Starfield and Indiana Jones could appear on non-Xbox platforms. Uh, I highly recommend checking this article out. I'll see if I can find a way to link it in the description of the show. It's very, very detailed, and it's real journalism, which is not what I'm claiming to do on this show. Uh, I have a journalism minor in my degree for a reason. But this article is fantastic and really details it out in, in much more of an eloquent way than I could ever do. But yeah, this was essentially confirmed on the official Xbox podcast Uh, Phil Spencer came out and said that four previously exclusive Xbox games will now be coming to PS5 and Switch. Uh, I believe there were rumors of it being Grounded and a couple others. I'm really hoping for Sea of Thieves. Oh, Hi-Fi Rush was one of them. I'm really hoping for Sea of Thieves on PlayStation uh, for purely selfish personal reasons because I desperately want to play that game with my friends. Uh, And if that were to come to PlayStation, that would be huge. I think we'd have a ton of fun with it. And honestly, Sea of Thieves is one of those games you kind of have to play with friends because it, the solo experience is there, but it is very obviously meant to be a cooperative game. And I think the more people that can get their hands on the game, the better the game is going to be, and the more people that can experience it is a is a positive in my book. So how does Xbox... Why is Xbox doing this change where they're kind of moving away from the console ex- exclusivity and sort of licensing out to their competitors, ostensibly? Uh, It's because they're running out of ideas, honestly. Uh, I think it makes the most sense economically for Xbox. If they can't get their own audience on the console, they might as well, quote, sell out to other companies. That's me quoting, because, you know, sell out's a pretty harsh word, but it's, you know, that's kind of what they're doing. 
we're already seeing Sony publish games on Xbox with games like MLB The Show coming to Games Pass. But when you boot up MLB The Show on your Xbox, you see a PlayStation Studios logo in the intro, which is disorienting at first. But it's kind of a you know a, an omen of this future of maybe we're moving away from these console exclusives, especially if PlayStation has won this quote co- you know the console wars we always talk about. Maybe this is Xbox's way of saying, hey, you know, maybe this just isn't our or this isn't for us. And we're going to find another way to stay relevant in 2024 and, you know, going forward. It does come with a lot of risks, obviously, uh, because this is admitting defeat in a way. And it's going to be it's going to make it even tougher to sell Xboxes. Uh, This is a quote from Tom Warren's article from The Verge again. He ends his article with a really great point. He says, quote, if you can play Xbox games anywhere, including PC, the cloud, Nintendo Switch and PS5, then why would you want an Xbox? <laughs> and that's a great point. Uh, I know Xbox was testing or showcasing uh, sort of a version of a Fire Stick or a, a Google Chrome Stick, where you just it's a little it's a very small device that you just put into your the back of your TV, and that's how you play your Xbox games. Things are streamed over the cloud, and Xbox is making a huge push in the cloud gaming sphere. Uh, I've dabbled with it a little bit on my phone, but for me personally, it's really not something that's relevant to my life. I, I it's good if you travel or if you can't get to a console, but I don't really have that problem. Um, But if Xbox were to go that way of saying, okay, well, we can't, we're not going to sell, you know, a five, six hundred dollar console, but you can spend maybe a hundred bucks on a, you know, a 4K Xbox stick. They got to come up with a different name. And then you pay for Games Pass every month, which continues to go up in price then maybe that's how they make their money. Is, is it going to be as much money as Sony would make with a PS6 release with a you know Last of Us 3 or God of War 3? I don't know. But maybe that's the only option left for Xbox at this point because they've had so many failures. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Games Pass uh, appeal is not quite what it used to be. And I'm the, you know, I tell people all the time to get Games Pass, but, you know, with the release of Redfall and Starfield and the... Those games were not good, in my opinion. Uh, and critically, they were not received well either. So why is Games Pass important and relevant? And you're still getting that Netflix of gaming, but a big selling point for Games Pass was those first-party games. And if two of the biggest ones, I think they were both of the biggest ones that Xbox had last year, being Redfall and Starfield, come out and are largely disappointments. There are Starfield defenders out there, not so much for Redfall, but then what does that promise of exclusives really mean? Now, I did read a report that I forgot to include in the show for this. It was, uh, I think it might actually be in Tom Warren's article from The Verge. He breaks down Xbox moving their financial goals around, and they were really banking on Games Pass to kind of be very popular uh, with the releases of Redfall and Starfield. But, of course, those games were disappointments for most people. So those financial goals had to be (laughs) re-evaluated. Um, but I'm curious to see what Xbox is going to do going forward for, for someone that is fortunate enough to own all three of these consoles. I am very much looking forward to Xbox games coming to PlayStation because I've said this before, but all my friends are on PlayStation. So the more games we can play together, the more games I can con them into buying to play with me (laughs) is, uh, is a positive. And I think the, the more, I was never a super big fan of console exclusivity, because I think everybody should be able to play whatever they want, wherever they want. I think that makes games better. And I know that, you know, the capitalist out there is not going to approve of that. But I think the more games that people are able to have access to, the better. And if that means Xbox is going to make their Amazon Fire Stick, their equivalent of it, and if they're going to be licensing out their games to other platforms, at least they're going to be making money off them because you're expanding your market, you're expanding your audience. And I I really don't know what else they would do, right? Because you're not getting people to buy Xboxes. You're, you don't really have the first-party suite that, that Sony has. And it's just, I think that, that Xbox is never going to be able to compete with that with PlayStation. It's just not going to happen. They're, they're a different company. They make different games. It's becoming, to, it's getting to the point where it's almost apples and oranges comparing the two when you're talking about those first-party releases. Xbox is, it seems to be they're angling more for the multiplayer, 
multimedia experience, but even that is, <laughs> I mean, Sea of Thieves is a big one for them. If you watch any Xbox conference, it's a lot of those kind of games, the Sea of Thieves. Grounded, they push a lot. I wasn't a big fan of that game, but I guess it's popular. Now, we did do an episode covering the developer direct, and that's games Indiana Jones, Hellblade. Uh, what was the other one called? I covered it. You can go listen to the episode. It was like the first one we did. Indiana Jones is going to be big for Xbox. Now, if they're already selling that out to other companies, <laughs> is that going to diminish the, their profit return? I doubt it. Honestly, with something like Indiana Jones, I think if they just give that to everybody, they're going to make a ton of money off of it. And I think limiting it to Xbox might hurt their profit margin, honestly. So I think if something like that comes, you know, a big IP like Indiana Jones from the guys that made Wolfenstein, I think that's a pretty good title to test out this multi-platform distribution thing. That and Sea of Thieves. So we'll see what happens. Uh, we will see what happens going forward with Xbox. I'm hopeful. You know, I, I'm. I was an Xbox kid first. Uh, they should make a Halo game, a new one that isn't bad. I think that would help. But I have no idea what the plans for Halo are now. So, anyway, moving on. So finally, we have PlayStation. Um, you would think that they're in the lead when it comes to mass market appeal. But a lot of this PlayStation news kind of ties back into Xbox. I think in the show notes, I might have the least to say about PlayStation because it's the Xbox coming to PlayStation is kind of the big headline here. uh, Some upcoming releases for PlayStation in 2024, there really aren't that many. They're kind of taking it easy. Uh, They've got the big one is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, which I will talk about in my review section. And Rise of the Ronin from Team Ninja, that one looked pretty cool. Uh, This is some recent news regarding uh, PlayStation first-party games. This is from Ollie Welsh at Polygon. Quote, Sony won't release any big first-party exclusive PlayStation 5 games in any of its existing franchises this year or before the end of its next financial year in March 2025. Uh, The company admitted this in its latest financial report. This is from the report directly. Uh, quote, regarding first-party software, we aim to continue to focus on producing high-quality works and developing live service games. I should have put that in big letters. Oh, I did later in, in the next bullet point. Anyway, uh, and developing live service games. But while major projects are currently under development, we do not plan to release any new major existing franchise titles like God of War Ragnarok and Marvel Spider-Man. That's from uh, Sony's president, COO, and CFO, Hiroki Totoki which I should really learn how to pronounce that guy's name because I mentioned it last episode and I wasn't sure I got it right. Now, this does this does make sense, right? We just had Marvel Spider-Man 2. Fairly recently, we had God of War Ragnarok and God of War Valhalla. So these games are recent in the public eye. So it would make sense that Sony's going to take some time off to, you know, gear up for another, you know, a lot of games media people talk about it, and I have myself, setting up the dominoes, waiting for the dominoes to fall. The dominoes pretty much fell for Sony in the last couple of years with God of War, Spider-Man, Last of Us, uh, Horizon, you know, all these things that are their big single-player pillars are, they came out and they performed fantastically, and now Sony can kind of just hang out, right? I mean, especially with Xbox floundering, with Nintendo kind of waiting for the Switch to... It's a great time for Sony to kind of catch their breath and be like, all right, let's 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 kind of coast for a little bit, and then we'll ramp back up with, I'm assuming we're going to get Ghost of Tsushima 2. We'll be getting, a, in a very long time, Spider-Man 3. There's the Wolverine game from all those Insomniac leaks. And this, we're talking, you know, four or five years down the line with these kind of games. And yeah, I have written here, Sony doesn't necessarily need to have another banger year with Xbox doing what they're doing and Switch doing what they're doing. And PlayStation can also continue to port games to PC, right? That's what they've been getting into with Last of Us and God of War. Now, whether those are technically successful ports is a different story. Um, we saw the port of Last of Us and the the caveman Joel. Um, I'm not a PC gamer, but I follow a lot of them on YouTube, and there's the plight of the PC gamer uh, where the the ports... You, you think it would just work, and a lot of the times it just doesn't. Um, so I think if, if PlayStation is going to continue to port those games, they need to go do a good job. <laughs> they need to make them playable. Otherwise, that market's going to die pretty quickly. 
but yeah, Sony really not a whole lot to talk about. Uh, Final Fantasy is going to be the big thing that's coming out in at the end of February. Uh, that's probably going to crush. People are very excited about it. I'm excited about it, and I'm not even that big of a Final Fantasy guy. So we're going to see what happens. Um, I think all in all, 2024 is kind of going to be a cooling off period for the games industry. Uh, while there's some big releases like uh, Rebirth and Indiana Jones, uh, the big three seem to be taking a breath to see what their next big move is going to be. But who knows? You know, we the way these things work, we could have breaking news any day that tosses all this out the window. Uh, I did delay recording this a day or two to see what that Xbox news was going to be. So even that, you know, stories are breaking every day in, in the, the games industry, the, the hot, fast-paced world of, of games journalism, which, again, I'm not a games journalist. I just quote them. Uh, but I want to know what releases in 2024 you are looking forward to. Are you excited for Final Fantasy, Indiana Jones, anything like that? Uh, if there's nothing coming out for you this year, are you looking to dive into your backlog? Part of the reason I do this show is because I have such a big backlog of games that I never finished that I like to get caught up on. So is there anything like that for you? Uh, you can leave a comment. Uh, you can email us. You can. There's actually, it's a big reveal I'm going to say for the end of the show, actually. I can, more ways to get in touch with me. But let me know. You know, I'm curious to see what you guys are playing and, and what you're excited for this year. But we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to get into some game reviews. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, we're back on No Credits Rolled. We just got done covering what the major console manufacturers are going to be doing in 2024. And now we're going to get into the game review portion of the show. First game I've got here is Tekken 8. Of course, the fighting game from Bandai Namco. Why did I say it like that? Namco. One of the big fighting games for mainstream audiences, of course, alongside Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, which also saw recent releases in the last couple of years. So this was kind of the last one we were waiting on to see how good it was going to be. Uh, I would like to preface this by saying I'm a very, very casual fighting game fan. Uh, even though I desperately would like to be good at them, uh, I'm just not. <laughs> uh, I watch fighting game YouTubers and I try to you know do what they do and learn from them, but I just don't think I have the reaction time for it and the level-headedness to sort of think on the fly. However, I do really enjoy the story campaigns of these games. I like doing them no matter what. I really enjoyed Mortal Kombat 1's story campaign. I haven't finished Street Fighters because the world of fighting or whatever it's called is a little... It's not quite the curated single-player narrative that I'm looking for. Uh, I do like to play the arcade versions of these games, especially if there are character endings, which is one of the big reasons I decided to pick up Tekken 8. Tekken 8 is known for their wacky arcade endings, uh, this is the first Tekken I've played at launch. I played seven after the fact, very casually with friends. I got uh, you know Negan and and Noctis and all them, and so that was fun. Uh, but I don't really, I don't know Tekken very well. But I decided to pick this one up at launch just because it looked so cool. I've been following a lot of the coverage of it leading up to it, the hype for it, uh, and now that I finally got my hands on the game, it's a ton of fun. Uh, it's visually distinct from other fighting games. And it's got a real sense of flair and dramatics that I'm really enjoying. The opening cutscene for the story, this isn't really a spoiler because you can you'll see it right away. Uh Jin, the main character, he like drives a motorcycle up a building and throws it out a helicopter. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm in. This is great. Like <laughs> this is exactly right up my alley. The fast and furious level of action that this this campaign has gotten to. And before you know it, there's like devils flying around shooting laser beams out of their head. I'm I'm totally on board for that. There's also, a, I didn't include this in the show notes, but there's a great uh, little, I don't know how you, you can call it, a recap section kind of, because, you know, it's Tekken 8, so there's seven other games you got to get caught up on. Uh, there's a little, there's little uh, vignette videos you can watch in the game that kind of summarize the important beats to get you ready for Tekken 8, and that was pretty helpful. Uh, I've watched lore videos on YouTube, but getting it firsthand from the game uh, was pretty helpful, especially before I start the campaign, because there's a lot of characters and there's kind of a lot going on uh, that you need to be caught up on. Actually, you don't need to be caught up on it. It doesn't really matter that much. But if you want to be caught up, you can be. So I've played probably about half of the story campaign. The uh, The combat is very satisfying. Uh, you know, each hit feels like earth-shaking and impactful. And you combine that with the visual effects, it's a very enjoyable experience. And it does feel different from, uh, you know, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. The game doesn't take itself too seriously either, which I really like. You know, there's a talking panda and a grizzly bear named Kuma who make up the main cast. Uh, Kuma's my favorite character. Uh, 
I just think he's funny looking. And apparently he has like a very in-depth backstory. And yeah, like I said before, the arcade endings are also iconic for the Tekken series. And and I see why now. Uh, they're very funny. I did Kuma's. He has like a like a romance fantasy with the panda bear. Highly recommend it. Uh, that was a 10 out of 10. But yeah, I'm going to give this game a shot and see if I can stick with it. I haven't ventured into online yet. I tried that with Street Fighter for a while, and I just have no ability to get good with these games. Uh, well, we're going to see. You know, <laughs> there's a lot, there's plenty of characters in there to do the arcade ending, so that'll keep me busy for a while. But I'm, you know, maybe I'll main Kuma. Cool maybe I'll get really good at him and, and see where the wind takes me. But yeah, if you're looking for a new fighting game, I would highly recommend it. Uh, if you like kind of wacky action stuff, uh, this is probably going to be the game for you. So that's Tekken 8. The other game I wanted to talk about today was Final Fantasy VII Remake, uh, the first one. I know what you're thinking, Sam, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is just around the corner. Why are you just now playing Final Fantasy VII Remake? Well, dear listener... I tried playing it before uh, multiple times, and it never really clicked with me. Uh, I feel very late to the party with this one, uh, not just because I didn't play the original Final Fantasy VII. I know that game is beloved. But I gave this remake a ton of tries when it came out and just couldn't really get into it. I lost the narrative of the story pretty quickly, and I found the combat to be pretty overwhelming. Uh, It turns out I was just doing it wrong. (laughs) Uh, I bumped the difficulty down to easy, which you can shame me if you like, but I found that lately when I'm trying to get through these games and trying to enjoy them and have fun, that's the easiest way to do it. Um, I'm seeing a lot of hype about this sequel, Rebirth, and I actually played the demo first, the Rebirth demo that's out now. I played that, and that kind of got me back interested in uh, Remake because the demo for Rebirth is awesome. It's a ton of fun. You get to play as Sephiroth, who's like the bad guy, but he's got a cool samurai sword. Like I said, I don't know anything about this series really, but playing that demo, it kind of got me back into it. I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. So I did, and now you can play Remake with the PS5 upgrades, and Remake is just visually incredible looking, right? I mean, the textures, the lighting, the the character models, it's all, it's ridiculously good looking. (laughs) I don't know how else to describe it, but um, it's very, very impressive. And for me, as someone who's easily swayed by visual upgrades, it was the perfect little treat on top for to get me back in. Um, I did pick up my old save, which was fairly close to the end of the game, and I'm trying to find a way that we can get, uh, get my gameplay footage incorporated into the show. So if that's happening and you're seeing my gameplay footage, it's going to be from the end of the game. So spoilers, uh, you can skip ahead if you like, but that was when I started recording. I uh, started recording, so that's what we're going to use. So yeah, I still don't really know what the story is, but to the part that I'm at now, I'm definitely back in on the story. Uh, I'm not back in enough to replay the whole game because I know it's really long, uh, but it's enough to finish Remake. I think I'm almost done, and I probably will pick up Rebirth. I don't know if I'll pick it up at launch because it's, you know, these games are very expensive, Um, but the characters are all very, very cool, and like I said, well-designed. With the combat set to easy, it's a lot more enjoyable. I'm figuring it out more. I'm figuring out what I'm supposed to be doing, um, and it makes me sound really dumb, and, you know, maybe I am. Um, maybe I just don't pay attention. I think that might be my real problem. But I don't feel like I'm fighting for my life in every encounter, which is what I ran into before. But despite it being at the end of the game where I'm picking up, I am getting into the story and, you know, falling in love with these characters, and it makes me even more excited for Rebirth. Uh, like I said, I played the Rebirth demo. There's a lot of quality of life changes in that game that's going to make it even more appealing to me. They pull the camera back, which is the biggest thing I noticed. In Remake, you're very tight uh, with Cloud. You're kind of directly there with him. But in the demo for Rebirth, you're pulled back. You can see a lot more stuff. And I think that makes it a little bit easier to navigate these environments as well. Uh, For the longest time, I thought I wasn't getting a game that was beloved universally. I mean, everybody seems to love Final Fantasy VII specifically. Even if you don't like the other Final Fantasy games. It's like seven, ten. Those are the ones that everybody loves. And it's nice to finally be on board, honestly. I I mean, I'm hoping that I stick with it and enjoy Rebirth. That game looks like I can play it for 25 years and still find new things. But we're going to see what happens. Um, So yeah, finally late to the party, but enjoying the party nonetheless. Hey everyone, so this is Sam in the editing process. Future Sam speaking to you now. Uh, As between the time of recording and the time of posting, a couple things have come up in the news 
uh, end with my gameplay of Final Fantasy VII that I wanted to hit on uh, just before we post. So a couple things off the bat. Uh, we have we have Grounded now coming to Switch, uh, previously an Xbox exclusive, now being part of that, what we talked about on the show, Xbox branching out and distributing on other platforms. Uh, so yeah, Grounded was never one for me, but if you like bugs, uh, I think there's lots of bugs in that game, so go ahead and check that out. And I believe we've got the, still the rumors of Sea of Thieves and things like that that will be coming to PlayStation in the future, so check that out as well, hopefully. Uh, one thing I want to hit on here, that I, this was in the Nintendo Direct, but it was part of a larger announcement anyways, the Battlefront 1 and 2 Classic Collection. Uh, I cannot describe to you how excited I was when I saw this. When I watched that Nintendo Direct, I said that it was the thing that I was most excited to see, despite the fact that it really had nothing to do with Nintendo. Uh, They're bringing back Battlefront 1 and 2. I have it already pre-ordered on the PS5. 64-player multiplayer. We're getting getting all the old maps. We're getting some new maps like Jabba's Palace. They're adding new characters. Kit Fisto, Asajj, Ventress. It's what a time to be alive, folks. Uh, What is old is new again. And I'm very excited. Now, what I would have, what I would have liked, you know, a full graphical oval overhaul, but you can't always get what you want. But you can get what you need. And what I need is me and my friends hopping in Battlefront 2, a, a 10-year-old game, and we're gonna have a blast. I guarantee you that. I think that's coming out in early March. So hey, it might be a topic on the show. We'll we'll uh, we'll have to see. Uh, and then I've got some things about Final Fantasy VII. I played the DLC, uh, which takes place after the story of the main game. So it's Yuffie's story for you Final Fantasy VII fans out there. Uh, funny story, I only know all these characters from Kingdom Hearts. So got a lot more Yuffie here. Uh, Yuffie has become my second favorite character in this uh, game universe. Barrett is, of course, my number one. He's the best. But Yuffie, you know, I, I really really came to like her. Um, she's really funny. She made me laugh out loud a lot. I love her energy. She reminds me a lot of like a, you know, a shonen character, like a Naruto or something. She's really goofy. Um, she's just really enjoyable to, to have in scenes. The combat, a ton of fun. I think the combat was a real step up in this DLC. Just the way Yuffie fights uh, it was a blast. Uh, you've also got those synergy moves, which I learned about in the Rebirth demo, but of course, I guess, originated in this, because I played this um, after that. But the synergy moves, where you can synergize with other characters and do these cool combo moves, are very, very visually impressive looking, uh, and I cannot wait to see more of them in Rebirth, because even the little tease we got with Sephiroth and Cloud in the Rebirth demo was a ton of fun to, just to see and to feel in gameplay. Uh, this DLC, of course, introduced more characters. Uh, again, I've I've been pretty honest about the fact that I don't really have a super tight grasp on the story. Uh, I'm kind of just feeling it out as we go. Uh, that being said, they introduced specifically two characters in this DLC that I thought were pretty cool looking. There's like a guy with robot wings, and then there's a guy who has like long white hair, and he's like hooked up to this thing. Final Fantasy fans are probably ripping their hair out, but, you know, they look pretty cool. I like those guys. Uh, Yuffie's friend was cool while he was in the story. Not necessarily going to spoil what happens to him. Uh, but he was cool. He had a big stick sword thing. I like that. Uh, but yeah, I, overall, I just wanted to hit on this because it is this DLC is obviously very important to the game and is meant to be played alongside it. I'm still really excited for Rebirth. Judging by how we're getting these episodes out every two weeks, that might be the topic of our next show. Not the whole topic, unless I want to break down sales numbers. But it might be part of the review portion of the show, because I've, if I can get my hands on it in time. So yeah, stay tuned for that. And we're going to throw it back to past Sam to give you the outro. <laughs> But yeah, that's going to wrap up episode four of No Credits Roll. Thank you so much for listening or watching or wherever you're getting the show. A couple show notes announcements. I decided to move this to the end of the show to hit all this stuff. Uh, We are on YouTube now. You can search No Credits Rolled uh, if you would like video versions of the podcast and a bunch of other podcast providers. I believe if you get podcast anywhere, we are likely going to be on that service. So check us out. You can email questions or comments to us. Uh, that's at nocreditsrolled at gmail.com. I got the don't, the uh, email address for the show. Pretty cool. Uh, this one I'm pretty excited for. I made a call in line because, you know, I come from radio and 
I just think a call in line's cool. So you can call in and leave us a voicemail at 856-209-0713. That's 856-209-0713. And hey, maybe we'll play it on the air. You can, you know, leave a question, leave a comment, anything you want, and maybe we'll play it on the air. Strong maybe, you know, strong maybe. Uh, you can also make sure you subscribe to No Credits Rolled on Spotify and Apple and everywhere else, like I said. If you're feeling generous, you can check out the Patreon. That's up and running. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much all I got for today. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time on No Credits Rolled.